relax. <laughs> Right, this is a recording of Professor Hugh de Wardner, Wednesday the 10th of March 1999 for the uh, International Study of Nephrology. I think it's um, almost 18 years since you retired, but perhaps we could start with your background, how you became a medical student, how you got into medicine. Well, at school I was um, training to be a, an engineer. And one day I got involved in a... One thing, it's just become very apparent, stop here. Uh, this is an interview with Professor Hugh de Wardner on Wednesday the 10th of March 1999 for the International Society of Nephrology. I think it's almost 18 years since you retired, but perhaps we could start with how you got into medicine. Well, I was originally being trained to be an engineer at school. Then I realized I, I couldn't do mathematics. I just didn't really like them. And at that time, we were very poor, and I asked my mother, my, I always wanted to be a doctor, but uh, I didn't think we could afford it. And uh, I wrote one despairing letter to my mother, and I said, is it possible? She said, yes, yes, all right. So I switched and into medicine, which I'd always wanted. And then you were a student at St. Thomas's, is Thomas's, that right? Thomas's, yes. Uh, but you'd also had some French background as well, I think, hadn't you? Well, I got a very complicated background, <laughs> terribly complicated. The name is French, but um, in the French Revolution, my family went off to Austria to avoid their heads being cut off. And then uh, my great, my grandfather, my grandfather on my father's side was at the Battle of Solferino, which was a terrible disgrace because the, the Italians beat the, 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 the Austrians. All oh, right. And he was in the Austrian army. <laughs> So he immigrated to America, and uh, there he had three children, one of whom was my father, who then came to France with his mother, and he was sent to school in England. <laughs> so there was my father in France, England, and my mother came from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and came to learn a bit of singing in Paris, and they met there. So these two Americans had this child, me, 1915. So for, at first I was half American and half uh, French. And then I became English when I realized I'd have to do military service in France. And I preferred to, I didn't want to do any hard, I hardly knew anybody in France or America for that mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. All my friends were in England. So I became naturalized English while yeah. I was a medical student. Natural break there, gentlemen. Prof, you just lift your one foot and kick that black cloth underneath your foot again again. The squeak from your rubber on the floor. Oh, sorry. That's all right, don't worry. Um, just give yourself again 10 seconds and okay. continue. All this will edit quite naturally. Right from the beginning? No, 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 no. no, no. From, from right. when you start. Whether you, you qualified as a student at St. Thomas's and what happened to you then? Well, I couldn't wait to get a job at Thomas's. Uh, I applied for one job and I didn't get it, and then I was left with five pounds. So I just took the next job I, I, uh, I was offered which was in Scunthorpe, which was wonderful practice, I must admit. I was the, there was a house physician, a house surgeon, and a resident surgeon. And that's all for about 150, 200 beds. And I was the uh, eye houseman, the ENT houseman. I did casualty every other night. And uh, about a week after I, qu uh, I arrived at Scunthorpe, the uh, consultant physician, my boss, wrapped himself around a tree, and I never saw him again. And there was no registrar. So here I was, newly qualified, in charge of all the medical beds and the children. It, it was very wearing, I mean, <laughs> but extremely good for me. I don't know how good it was for the patient. I learned a lot. And then uh, shortly afterwards, I think you, you the, it was the Second World War, you joined the army, is that right? Or how, yes, what I, um, well, I wanted to join the RAF. Yeah but uh, a lot of competition for that. And uh, I had to fill up a form, and I said I spoke French, obviously, born there. Mm. In fact, I spoke French before. I didn't speak English till I was eight. And 
So I was sent to Singapore as soon as I joined the, the army. Because you spoke French? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said I spoke Malay <laughs> when I got to France. Yeah. So anyway, you went to, in the, the Royal Medical Corps, presumably, mm. was it, and uh, sent to Singapore. Can you tell us what happened there? Well, I, as you know, it was a disaster. The um, guns all pointed the wrong way. Singapore was a fortress against, against a sea attack. Nobody had envisaged that the, uh, an army would come down the, the mainland, mm. the, the peninsula. So the Nips did what they liked, and they just walked down. And we, we arrived a month before the, the final armistice, so to speak. And um, I went up country for about a week, and then came quickly back again, retreating fast. And on the 15th of February at 6 p.m., 1942, <laughs> the war finished out there, and it was, a, it was a wonderful relief. We were defeated, but the noise had been so awful, terrible. And there we were, were prisoners of war. So I, I think you were then spent nine months in Singapore uh, yes, running. Yes, the first part of yeah. that, in, until the end of that year, 1942, we were in Singapore. And uh, we, I was working in a huge building called the Roberts Building, which had 800 dysentery cases. Really? Yeah. And I looked after a ward of 80. I mean, the it was divided into 10 wards of, of, of 80 each. And eventually, I got uh, dysentery myself. And we had a very good colonel, the field ambulance. When I recovered, he said, what would you like to do? So I said, well, I, I'd really like to try and find out why these people are dying, because they're not dying of dysentery. So he said, all right, off you go. And. Um, the problem was they, they, were, they were going into coma, mm. and um, there were three things. I mean, retrospectively, it's easy. There was encephalitis lethargica, one or two cases. There was a, a syndrome, which now is now known due to riboflavin deficiency, mm. with um, optic atrophy and um, spastic legs and a very raw tongue. Mm. And then there was vernicus encephalopathy which um, I must say, it wasn't I who recognized it. It was the pathologist who recognized it at post-mortem. It's very, very classical uh, punctate hemorrhages in the mammillary bodies and parts adjacent. And uh, we had, we were very lucky. We had a, a, quarterly, a quarterly journal of medicine which had an account of, I can't remember if it was Wernicke's encephalopathy or it was, or it was B1 deficiency, but anyhow, Wernicke's mm. encephalopathy came into it. And uh, so it was clearly a B1 deficiency, and there were B1 deficiencies occurring in the dysentery ward in these patients, very, very of various kinds. So we had um, a box, I think, of 100 ampoules of B1, five milligrams, I think, or it might have been one milligram, anyhow, very powerful stuff in those days. And that was what we had to treat this uh, incidence of Vernicus. And I spent my time going around asking all the people in charge of these wards if, they were, if there were any such cases, any cases they were worried about. Mm. And I was therefore able to follow the onset of Vernicus and then stop it for treatment. And, and of course, at that time, presumably, I mean, they were very, the you know, diet was appalling. So that was why you got the vitamin yes, deficiencies. Oh yes. And then you got the dysentery on top, which that, that precipitated uh, the crisis. That was it. Um, and you, you, you recorded all this. and uh, Yes, we, uh, yes I, I made a lot of notes, great package, which I then took on with me when, when we went up to Siam later. But what sort of training in medical research had you had up to then? I mean, why do you think you sort of were doing this? I mean, there can't be many others. Well, I've always, I mean, right from the beginning, before I was qualified, I always thought of being in medicine as being in research. It was a sort of intuitive feeling mm. that that's what you did, or if you were lucky enough, and you could do it. And uh, I've always wanted to know why, how, and here was a very good uh, example. And that's a sort of recurring theme we'll come back mm -hmm. to, I think, isn't it? So in the, after uh, nine months or so, you, the, the, you moved up to Siam, to mm -hmm. the 
where they were building the railways and so on. Do you want to say a bit about that and what happened to these results, or <laughs> records that you had? Yes. Um, we moved up. We, uh, the, the trip up to Siam was, was quite uh, a horrific one. We were, we were in rubber trucks, rather packed in. And uh, the, the nice Malays, the good ones, were throwing pineapples at us. Well, it's all right. When you're traveling at 40 miles an hour, the pineapple comes into the compartment. It produces a, an effect. And um, it took about two and a half, three days to get up there from Singapore. It was pretty hot. And um, we were sent to build a railway. And we were lucky because we were some of the first to arrive. So we built the beginning of the railway, nearest the mm. civilization there was. Whereas the last lot, the people who tried to stay behind, and did stay behind until the very end, they went right through us. And they went right up to the top of the mountain. And they were dec decimated by disease. I think it was 60% mortality, something like really? that. Really? Yeah. But um, we, we built a bit, and then we moved on, built another bit, and so on. So presumably you were, again, working as a medical officer, treating That's people, right, yeah. diphtheria, cholera. Well, the excitement, the first one, the first thing I was put in charge of was a diphtheria ward where the only thing you could do was keep them still, make certain mm. they didn't sit up. And considering the place where they slept was covered with lice, <laughs> it was not very easy to, 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 to stay still. So yeah. why did they have to stay still? I, I know. Well, diphtheria, severe diphtheria, one of the things that kills you is something to do with your heart. Mm. I'm not quite certain why it kills you suddenly. You can, of course, die slowly which is terrible. We had one or two of those. Uh, the liver gets very enlarged, very rapidly. I imagine it's a mixture of toxin and, 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 and high venous pressure. But anyhow, very painful and most distressing. But the other form of, of death is the person sits up or does something sudden physically, boom, out. All right. Mm. And I knew that much about diphtheria. <laughs> and the person I'd taken over from had rather a few deaths, rather, rather a lot of deaths from this. So I thought, well, that's one thing I can avoid. And so we did that. And then when we moved, I was put in charge of the cholera. Uh, the cholera developed, mm. and uh, uh, that um, we didn't get so many recover from cholera as, as they recovered from diphtheria. It was a horrific time during the monsoon, of course, mm. the river mm. corpses coming down. Mm. And uh, we were put in an area on the other side of a ravine, which is sort of some sort of isolation. And uh, the slipperiness of the tents, the slipperiness of people carrying these feces mm. in this mud, trying to get to the pit in the middle of the night. I mean, yes, horrendous. Were, you, you were telling me something about how you, the, they were extracting plasma from people who recovered from diphtheria. From the diphtheria, yes. Yeah. Well, well I, I had practical experience of that myself because I got a diphtheritic ulcer, which was extremely painful. And what we did, we bled people who'd recovered from diphtheria, stirred their blood a bit to make it clot so as to remove the mm. red cells, and then gave about 50 ml of the plasma with all its antibodies. I must say it worked. It worked. Mm. I mean, um, on me, which had a very minor attack, within about an hour or two, the pain stopped, the redness around diminished, and it began to suppurate. So it was on its way, yeah, healing. Yeah. But uh, for the severe cases, I don't think it did much good. And you continued your study in Vernicas and Well, we got four more B1, cases yeah. amongst the, the, the people in, in the upper river. And what happened then, I mean, in terms of the Japanese? Uh, oh, well, the, eventually the, the railway was built, mm. and we all came down it. We hadn't imagined that we were going to be going to actually ride this thing. <laughs> and we, uh, many people remembered some of the things that they'd done to sabotage the Bankments. And then we had to ride on this thing down. But we arrived safely at the other end. And um, over a period of time, the war by now was improving. Mm. And uh, the Nips realized that they were losing. And they began to try and prevent any form of uh, evidence of how they treated their prisoners. And the best way to do that was to search them 
when they when they were moved, mm. because at that then you knew where to hide. And I wanted to hang on to all this, these case notes about Wernicke's because I realized they were precious. And nobody had ever studied Wernicke's before. Nobody had ever established that Wernicke's encephalopathy was actually due to B1 deficiency until that time. Mm. Because Wernicke's up till then was, was alcohol, not diet, ridden. So um, I got together with a few friends and we, we put our notes in a four gallon tin which was soldered and um, then wrapped a a cape, and then dug a hole about two or three feet deep in a grave where somebody had been buried mm. eight feet deep, and we we put the, the we put our the notes up there, and we took bearings of various trees, because we didn't know when we'd get back, no. and we didn't know who'd be there when when the war was over. As a matter of fact, it was only three months later, and there was one of the three was in the camp. And he rescued it. It was just about time. The cape had gone, and there were holes appearing in the solder, in the, in the tin. But yeah, I was safe, and I brought it back. And subsequently, you, you published some... Uh, I published a paper on, on that, that, yes. 52 the cases of Venicus and Kefiropathy. It was clearly showing that it was due to B1 thiamine. Deficiency. In B1. fact, I, we, we, with Lennox, this was Bernard Lennox, yeah. was the pathologist from uh, Newcastle, uh, a Serbic bloke very intelligent, very amusing, and um, I can't remember what, what, what was the question. Well, j just that you'd shown this was due to thiamine deficiency and that uh, that was not uh, up till then clear at that time. Shown, no. yeah. But I mean, were there other people doing research in the, it seems a remarkable thing to do, doesn't it? I mean, if you look no, back well, on it. No, well, I mean, you do research if you find something to research in, don't you? Like? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and there it was. <laughs> okay, well, you came back to England, and w can you, how did things go then? You well, the army was extremely good to, to, to people who came back from POWs. They said, oh, go away for a year, and you better just recover, convalesce. So I went to Thomas's and got a job as a, in a course, a sort of registrar and a course in the, in the membership. And I got my membership at the end of a the year, then was found to have TB. So I spent another year in the army, and they said, where would you like to go? And I said, well, Thomas's. And they said, all right, off you go to Thomas's. <laughs> so I really had two years of um, convalescence, one without TB and one with TB. And then I eventually went back to Thomas's after having finished with my tuberculosis. So when that had got better, you then started working as a, as a registrar. registrar. Yes. Um, and on the, in the medical unit there. Well, first I went to St. Helier's. Right. And, um, I set up the diabetic clinic there. It seemed to me it was a bit, a bit um, mm. disorganized. And uh, I think it's still going. And I was there about a year, and then I went to Thomas's and joined the medical unit, which was the Department of Medicine. And at that time was when you first got interested in the kidney, is that correct? And how well, did that I was occur? I was really forced into the kidney. I mean, I, I, I joined the Department of Medicine because I wanted to do research. Mm. I did some research with Maureen Young, who was in the Department of Physiology, and uh, the research in polycythemia vera. And we had a lovely hypothesis because we discovered that the blood of polycythemics used oxygen at a very fast rate. In fact, we left some blood on the bench. We went to lunch when we came back, it was dark blue. And we didn't think that was normal blood. We did normal blood, it didn't go dark blue. So from then on, we studied. The one thing that came out of it, we established that people with polycythemia vera had a low oxygen tension in their arterial blood, and that has been shown since and is solid. But um, before we got that far, we had a lovely hypothesis that it was the white cells of polycythemic people who consumed a very high rate of oxygen, a uh, high amount of oxygen, and therefore in the bone marrow they would lower the oxygen tension, and that was why there were a lot of red cells. <laughs> well, it turned out there were just too many white cells. It was the leukocytosis of polycythemia right. that was doing it. And then one day, I was walking to outpatient. I was a bit late in the morning, and Sharpie Schaefer came alongside of me, who was professor, my professor. And he said, I wonder if you could go and help George Prunty. George Prunty was professor of chemical pathology and had just worked out the technique for doing pH and inulin. 
He says he's done this, but he doesn't know what to do with it. So I said, well, I don't want to go in the kidney. No, it's much too mathematical. I had this thing, I don't like mathematics. <laughs> and he said, well, just, just go and talk to him, just have a chat. So much against my will, I went upstairs to see Brunty. And in fact, the person who'd done it in his department was a fellow called McSweeney, who was an extremely nice bloke, and who'd been a POW, also the Japanese, but I, I didn't know him then. He was in Japan, saw the atom bomb, in fact, go off. Charming bloke. And he taught me how to do pH, how to do inulin, and I thought, all right, well, here I am. We might as well do the pH and inulin clearance of patient polycythemia, which I had. I had a whole group of them. Mm. And, that, and we went on from there. And then, uh, shortly afterwards, was when you first got interested in sodium and uh, uh, sodium excretion, which is obviously one of the yes, major um, factors in your later life. Can you? The, the, the sodium came about because we got interested in emotional diuresis. Mm. In fact, I called it compulsive. What, what did we call it? We had a name for it. Published the name. I think. Well, I forget what, it, what what we call the paper. But anyhow, there was one particular patient who had hypertension, and we put a catheter into her bladder, and she poured salt and water out. Well, everybody said she'd had a drink, mm. so we kept her in. We dehydrated her. She lost weight. Plasma osmolarity rose put a catheter in, poured out salt water. And the GFR, as measured by creatinine excretion, didn't change. So this was fascinating. This, this was an unknown phenomenon. How was she doing this? And really, that, that was what led to the experiments in dogs, showing that there were other influences on sodium excretion other than GFR or aldosterone. Do you want to say a little bit about those experiments and how? Yes, we, it, it, it started over coffee with Ivor Mills. Ivor Mills had come back from the NIH mm -hmm. where he had been playing with aldosterone. In fact, he came back with some aldosterone, very precious at that time. We were having coffee, and I don't know what, how the conversation led to it, but I remember saying to him, I'm sure we can make a person have a sodium diuresis right through your aldosterone. I don't think it's very important. <laughs> he was shocked. I said, all right, well, I said, we'll, we'll set up an experiment. And uh, to my mind, it was pretty, I, I mean, I wanted to do this, really. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show, because of these emotional diuretic women, I wanted to show that you could lower the GFR and still get a rise in sodium excretion. And it was even better with uh, Ivor Mills' aldosterone because we mm. could give aldosterone in large doses before we started. So we did. We got a dog and put a balloon in the upper aorta and blew the balloon up. GFR dropped. We then started saline. Saline went up, went in, and the sodium excretion went up. GFR went down. And um, then, of course, there were all the problems that it might be the dilution of the blood by the saline that was causing mm -hmm. the sodium diuresis and not something else. So we did other experiments, cross-circulation cross, cross, um, experiments, that showed that that was not so. So we put up the hypothesis that there was a naturalistic substance in the blood causing the sodium diuresis. And we got a lot of stick over the years about that. Um, why, do you year, think that why do you think that was? Uh, well, for one thing, nobody would repeat the experiment for at least two years. People but it was a pretty, pretty clear-cut experiment, wasn't of it? Of course, of course. But uh, clear-cut results, complex in, in, in setting it up and so on. And uh, it wasn't so much that they disagreed with the results. They disagreed with the idea that there might be a circulating substance. And then, mm. because of that, got rid of the results too. <laughs> and, and for years we were ribbed all the time. I mean, 
where's the white powder, Hugh, you know, at, at various meetings. And um, that search went on for a long time. And um, we, looked, we looked for it. And during the course of the years, it became a search for a sodium potassium ATPase inhibitor. Mm. Mm. And it was obvious that you could get extracts, which went, the concentration of which went up and down with volume expansion, which did inhibit sodium potassium ATPase. And then suddenly, De Bowl came out mm. with his naturalistic hormone, which was not a sodium potassium ATPase inhibitor. So, right, we were right, there was a naturalistic substance with volume expansion, uh, but uh, the stuff that we were looking for, sodium potassium ATPase inhibitor, was not it. A a a atrial nitrate peptide was not the substance we were looking for. So we continued to search mm. for the, for um, a sodium potassium ATPase inhibitor. And again, we didn't get, to, we didn't get that. As you know, others found that eventually. Well, we may come back to that, but perhaps mm. we could just talk a little bit about other things you did at St. Thomas's, which I think are of great interest. People may be less aware of it. I mean, you, you did a lot of work, I think, on renal biopsies at early. Yes, early. We, I was the first to do renal biopsies in England. I mm. read this paper in, in, Kidney, Inter in Kidney International by Brun and Iverson, mm. who, had, who were the first to do it in the world, to do biopsies. And um, we started. And there was a very nice pathologist whose name, and I, can't, I never can remember names anymore, but anyhow, he, I asked him if he would look at these biopsies. Mm. And he said, yes, if you'll look at them with me, because it's going to be very strange. It's going to be quite new. So right from the beginning, I looked at the biopsies with him, and I learned a lot of histology. And this led, well, we did biopsies in various conditions, and that was quite interesting. But I think the most interesting thing from the most original paper we, we published was a paper showing that the histological lesions, the severity of the histological lesions in, in uh, glomerulonephritis were not related to the GFR. They were much more related to the interstitial and tubular changes. Well, of course, as a physician, looking after the patients, knowing their GFR, it was very obvious. If you were a pathologist, you didn't know what the GFR was. If you were a clinician, you didn't really look at the biopsy very carefully. So that's what came from that. And that has stuck, of course. I mean, now that's developed as quite a, a thing. And other, it's been confirmed several times. And people are now working, as you know, on mm. why that is. Well, that's uh, interesting. another interesting observation. I mean, why did you look at the, on the biopsy? I mean, everyone's concentrating on the glomerulus. Why did you look at the tubers well, and I mean, the interstitial? Well, I mean, I was looking, I mean, I think one of the, th the, the most obvious example of this is amyloid. Mm. We <laughs> get these great chunks. I mean, the glomeruli right. look like bits of pink. Yeah. Not much of that. And yet the GFRs, in some cases, weren't, weren't all that bad. Yeah. yeah. I think that probably first put me onto it. And then I began to look at others. And there was a discrepancy. The, the other areas of work you were involved with is in control of water excretion and compulsive water drinking. Do you want to say a little yes. bit about that? Well, we, we got a few. And they were fascinating, I must admit. We, we tried our best to, to, uh, to, to make a diagnosis. It's very difficult to make a diagnosis. And, and this led to other experiments. We established, because of the compulsive water drinkers, we established the fact that drinking a lot of water diminished your ability to concentrate the urine. And uh, that was confirmed later by great friends of mine in America. And uh, this obviously makes it very difficult to use a dehydration test Mm. to distinguish between diabetes insipidus and pulsive water drinking, whatever you like to call it, because the, the urine osmolality is not going to rise very high. And uh, Erasmus Barlow and I, who was a psychiatrist, great friend, and published a paper in Quarterly Journal on compulsive water drinking. And they were fascinating cases, I must admit, the, the things they got up to. to, to, um, to, to they drank up to 10, 15 liters a day for no reason, no reason at all. We tried to treat them. We put them to sleep mm. for several days. 
let, let, let their sleep lighten occasionally, clean their teeth, and give them a scrub, and then put them back to bed and sleep. <laughs> the only thing about that was it was cured them all right. But they developed some other abnormal function. I mean, their arm, paralysis of an arm or something. Mm. It's a self-curing um, disease, I think, really. You don't hear of elderly people with compulsive water drinking. So you just sort of hang on, hang, hang in there, and eventually it goes. Okay, James, yep. that's great. We're just going to take a natural break there. <laughs> yeah, right. That's we'll going well. Are we going well? Yeah. Uh, we it's going really well. Yeah. Okay, I'm turning over. Okay. Well, there, there were also some other things you involved while you were involved in whilst you were at St. Thomas's. I think uh, you were also doing work on uh, urinary infection and pyelonephritis. Yes, we, we had a, an MRC funded. Oh, no, not, not at Thomas's. It's not until not, not I came to Charing Cross. <coughs> No, I got involved in, in uh, urinary infections, particularly, I think, mainly through the biopsies. Mm. We biopsied acute pyelonephritis, horrific sight. Bits of necrosis all over the place. I'd never, I, I don't think you ever see that. And people who die in the old days of pyelonephritis, the kidney was destroyed. Mm. But, uh, uh, an attack of acute pyelonephritis, which is controlled by antibiotics, you don't think of as multiple areas of necrosis in the kidney. So that, that really woke me to the, 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 the dangers of, of ascending infection, which I then pursued when I got into Charing Cross. And what do you feel about that now? I mean, what is that? Well, I, people know about giving prophylactic yeah. antibiotics now, and they treat it quickly. We, the, the, the real problem is, is urine cultures, and um, I don't know how well mm. general practitioners do urine cultures now, but uh, I imagine eventually the propaganda from everybody that you ought to culture the urine in a urine infection. That doesn't stop you treating straight away, mm. but um, you ought to know what you're treating. You were also involved, I think, in some experiments that Sharpie Schaefer was renowned for for um, fainting. inducing fainting. Do you that's want to right, say something right. about that? I was a that. subject. And uh, we also did a lot of renal blood flows and male filtration rates in fainting subjects. And one day I was the subject. <laughs> and it consisted of being on a tilting table and being bled. And of course, you bleed into your legs uh, because you're standing up. You're, you're, you're not standing on, you're, you're, you're supported. Mm. by a, a seat. And uh, I remember <laughs> as I started to faint, I said something about, um, I feel sick. And then I vomited. And there was a sister holding the catheter in my bladder, <laughs> just under me. <laughs> <laughs> and she stuck to her post. She held the catheter. <laughs> she held the catheter. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the last thing was that one could hear. I could still hear. I was, I, I'd lost sight, but I could still hear. This all happened over a few seconds. But I could still hear, and then I woke up uh, having recovered. And so... <laughs> you, uh, you also, I think, uh, wrote the, the, the first edition of your book, very yeah. well-known book on the kidney. How did well, that... Uh, well, again, that was sort of Schaefer-stimulated, though he didn't know it. We were having coffee. He was a great one for coffee at 10 o'clock. And um, I suddenly discovered, I was senior lecturer by that time, and he told me that the position didn't have tenure. I said, well, everybody else has seen it. He said, no, but not at Thomas's. Well, that, 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 that really, could, I mean, I, there I've been sitting relatively mm. comfortably, thinking the future was not too bad. And now there was, a, there was an end to senior lectureship. I might be kicked out any moment. So I thought, well, I'd better do something to get the name better known. And I'll write a book about the kidney, because there, had, there was no book about the kidney at all. There was Homer Smith's book, and that was about physiology of the kidney, and mainly about pH and inulin clearance. And there was another book about hypertension, very, very heavy going, and a bit about the kidney in there, but um, not very interesting. 
And there was nothing about glomerular nephritis, pyelonephritis, nephritis, nephrotic syndromes, renal failure and all this, and renal function, biopsies. So um, not knowing very much about the kidney, I must admit, I wrote a book about it, which was quite good because it uh, earned me a bit of money, certainly made the name better known, and I learned about kidneys. And then subsequently you did move, in fact, to Charing Cross Hospital. Right. Um, but before then, you, w you did first get involved in international cytic nephrology. Do you want to say? Well, that's the, s yeah. that's the same year. The, the yeah. year that I moved to Charing Cross, 1960, mm. was the first meeting in, uh, in uh, Switzerland. No, France. France, of course. Avion. I Avion. And um, there I met people that I would be seeing for a long time, subsequently. Henri Bourget, mm. whom I didn't know. In fact, I think that's why I became president of the, of the society later. Henri Bourget was a very powerful man in the society, and he rather liked me because I spoke French. <laughs> so I think he pushed. And uh, that was, that's another episode later on. Well, maybe we'll come back to that later mm. on in the sort of sequence. But at, at Charing Cross, you were appointed as a professor of medicine uh, there, but obviously your main interest was in... Uh, the kidney, um, and um, do you want to say how things developed there, or what, what, where would you? Well, the research that we did was uh, we set up, as I say, an MRC-funded unit for in renal infections. We started a tiny little metabolic. Well, this is Fulham Hospital, mm. which is probably one of the oldest London LCC hospitals. But we had a little two-bedded ward, and we turned it into a metabolic ward which was very useful. And um, we studied sodium and calcium. What else did we do? And continued the biopsies. And then, of course, we continued the, the, the work on sodium in dogs. And um, there was no animal house. Mm -hmm. This is Fulham Hospital, the old Fulham Hospital. So I went to the Welcome and asked them for an animal house, and they gave me one in six weeks. <laughs> Never forgotten it. <laughs> Absolutely marvellous. They didn't quibble or anything. So we set up a very rudimentary animal house, but still it worked. And we continued to do experiments. And I think we were the first to show that um, the plasma from volume expanded animals, blood volume expanded animals, inhibited sodium transport in fragmented tubular cells, mm. and it also in, in, uh, interfered with potassium transport so that the concentration of sodium went up and the concentration of, of um, potassium went down. And, and you went on pursuing, trying to isolate the substance? And we went on, yes. Yeah. We, we, I've always been trying to isolate yeah. um, something <laughs> and never getting there. <laughs> What about the, the important development, of course, was the, the development of dialysis? Dialysis, yes. Well, at that first meeting in 1960, I met Scribner. And uh, he was a little man who sat cross-legged in this armchair and told us about the first three cases that he had started on what I call maintenance hemodialysis. And I must admit, I thought it was rather like seeing a dog walk about on his hind legs, and it, 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 it didn't seem to me have any future. And I didn't think any more about it. And the next meeting was in Prague, and I couldn't go because of illness in the family, but the registrar went, Pete Little. He came back and he said, now there are six cases and the first three are still going, something like that. Mm. So I thought, right, it works. So I decided we, we, have, we have to have it too. So I managed to get some money and sent a nurse, a surgeon, and a physician off to Seattle to learn what to do. Because I've always believed, try and be first in everything. Mm -hmm. But if you can't be first, be second. Don't try and be first. Don't try and uh, start as if nobody's done it before. Because you'll, you'll just make the same mistakes. Mm. And we set it up. I think we heard about this in, in September, August, September of 1963, and we had our first patient on, I think, in April 64. 
And I mean, Subsystem became one of the biggest dialysis units in the UK, didn't it? At least for yes, well, hemo we, we and were hand the dialysis. first to have a maintenance hemodialysis unit in this country. Sheldon, of course, was in there and was dialyzing patients, I think, on, a, on that sort of basis before us. Mm. But uh, <laughs> it was done sort of sub rosa. Sheila Sherlock, who was his professor, he got into severe serious trouble with because he was spending much too much money. And um, in fact, we had to inherit one or two of his patients. So it was the first sort of properly set up. And then I think you were also involved in developing dialysis in the UK with the Yes, I was asked to go to the Ministry of, of Health to discuss this. Mm. And we had a long talk. And as a result, I was made chairman of a committee that set up certain principles, rules, uh, ideas. I mean, for instance, that a, a unit of dialysis patients should be 10. And uh, you, for that, you needed so many nurses or so many doctors, technicians, and so on. And if you had 20, well, you just sort of doubled up, but not quite. And what was in need needed. <coughs> and in fact, I think, I can't remember now, but we set up, I think, the first 16, 20 dialysis. Mm -hmm. I mean, they came mm -hmm. through us our auspices. And then one day when we set up the numbers that we had been asked to set up, I said, well now we, I got the community together, we've got to think about the future. <laughs> we were immediately dismissed. The committee was told it was no longer neat. And this I could see was an attempt to stop what was obviously going to be a great drain on finances. But anyway, subsequently, it did go on to develop, not oh, yeah. as, to the same extent as some other countries. Coming back to the the other things you were doing while you were at Charing Cross, um, the the of course you were also doing some work on finastin. I don't know if you want to mention that. Yes, important. well, we we ke we kept seeing cases of finastin uh, nephropathy, and. Um, there was this ridiculous argument that it wasn't really finacetin, it was aspirin and finacetin, which was silly. Mm. Because, uh, and that aspirin was just as bad, people got uh, that far. And yet, through questions in the House of Parliament, through MPs, I discovered that all the finacetin imported into England were through Monsanto. And, uh, it took some time because Monsanto said they, they didn't know how much was consumed in England because they, they imported into England and then it went mm. out to Europe. And then, so I said, well, if you want me to, I'll ask the minister, my MP, and that immediately got an answer. And there were so many thousand kilos of finastin. Mm. Then I discovered that aspirin in this country was made by one manufacturer in Scotland. There were, I don't know how many aspirin types of aspirin being sold, but only one manufacturer. So it's quite easy to find out how much was consumed. And there was far, far more aspirin consumed than finacetin. And yet, you never heard of an aspirin type real failure. Never. And so we thought we would um, publish a paper on this. Mainly, I think, because we, we had patients who needed operations who had finastin nephropathy. And they were dangerous to anesthetize because obviously uh, they lost a lot of water and yeah. salt yeah. during the recovery and developed worse renal failure. 